those in some semblance of order because we're all, we, all, we have people have classes after this and uh, this as you know is our uh, our second talk and uh, we will have another one not next week because that's spring break the week after that that will be announced uh, as well but we're delighted to have uh, Bob and Tony here today to talk about uh, some work that they've been doing in analysis and looking at the future. And, and Renee, and Renee I'm right sorry, there. and Renee too. Is she going to speak as well? Or? Tony and I will speak, but Renee's going to handle the questions. Okay, great. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Uh, about, particularly about uh, uh, fugitive emissions and other issues associated with the environmental impacts. And the, since you all know these people, they're going to give you additional introduction of themselves. And, We'll get started. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, yeah, we'll do that for you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to give a brief introduction and then turn it over to uh, yeah. Tony to give you some more of the background on the on shale development and the engineering in general. And then I'll come back and, and uh, talk through the, the final nuts and bolts of our, our material. We've planned this to be about a 45-minute talk, so that we'll have time for questions at the end, and we do ask that you hold off till then. By way of general introduction, let's show us what the Department of Energy thinks the, the uh, past has been over the last couple decades for natural gas in the United States and what they project into the future. So you can see the traditional forms of natural gas here, non-associated gas, have been diminishing over time. Uh, unconventional gas, tight gas, and shale gas have been increasing. So as of a year or so ago, shale gas was making up about 14% of the, of the U.S. natural gas production. The Department of Energy predicts that will be 45% of, of gas production by 2035. Now that's proceeding without a huge understanding of what the environmental consequences are. We're going to talk today just about the greenhouse gas emissions and the greenhouse gas footprint of this technology. I'm sure you've all seen statements like this. From the standpoint of global warming, this is a clean fuel, goes the statement, with 60% fewer emissions than, than coal. The particular statement I have here is made by a vice president from ExxonMobil back in the uh, fall, but the 60 minutes did almost exactly the same thing last fall. A lot of people have said this. Is that true? How much do we know about it? Now, there's some cautionary notes along the way. This is a letter that the Council of Scientific Society president sent to President Obama and senior administration officials last May. The Council is an umbrella group representing about 150 science disciplines in the United States, 1.4 million scientists altogether represented by this. And the Council wrote to the President that, you know, climate change is an imminent problem. The nation should be working more aggressively than we are on it, but that some of the solutions which are being proposed uh, may be worse than the actual problem. Uh, making ethanol from corn was singled out in the letter as one example of that. The second example highlighted was shale gas for the thought that this may actually be worse for global warming than uh, simply using other fossil fuels. This is our conclusion slide. Putting up now just to show you where we're going to be going, most of the talk will be deriving the, the numbers behind this. Uh, but the take-home message of our study is that if you do an integration of 20 years following uh, the development of the gas, that uh, shale gas is worse than conventional gas and is, in fact, worse than coal and is worse than oil. If you integrate it out 100 years into the future, our take-home message is shale gas is still worse than conventional gas, about the same as coal. With that, I'll turn over to Tony for some more background on the technology. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so this is the, as Bob said, the conclusion slide, but to get to the conclusions, you've got to do a lot of work. And so my job is to prepare you to understand some of the work that we've done in a short period of a, of a lecture. We obviously can't cover all the details, so we will have a paper that will appear. Bob will talk about that later, and that paper will be backed up by online materials and an in-depth uh, engineering report. So. What you don't get out of this presentation, you will soon be able to get out of reading materials. Again, before I 
uh, continue, I would point out that not only is Renee going to answer all our questions, but she did most of the work that I'm going to report on. <laughs> I would also like to point out that what you're seeing here is exactly what the ACSF has in mind about intercollegiate collaboration. Clearly, I don't know anything about climate science. Bob doesn't know anything about hydraulic fracturing, well design, or pipelines. But together, we're able to put something like this together for you to contemplate. So let me tell you what I'm going to do here. Um, before we could arrive uh, at a bar chart like this, which you're going to get to see again and again as the talk goes on, and you'll be able to understand it by the time the talk is over, a lot of dog work has to be done all the way back to where the first molecule of methane comes from. So that's where I come in, because my area of expertise is in hydraulic fracturing, rock mechanics, well development, and pipelines. That's been 25 years of my research career. So. As you probably gathered already from that chart, this is not just about unconventional gas, it's about gas. And what you'll find out is that there's a high likelihood, certainly not scientific proof yet, uh, that whether it's unconventional gas or conventional gas, uh, the entire global footprint, greenhouse glass, grass footprint, has not yet been assessed well. But we are highlighting unconventional gas because it's a contemporary problem for us in upstate New York. And I want to point out that there is a big difference between developing gas from an unconventional well and a conventional well for the mere reason that unconventional wells are bigger in many senses of the word. So the next couple of slides, I will highlight how that biggerness impacts the numbers that we're going to show you between unconventional gas and conventional gas. So a unconventional well has total long, total, a longer total length. It may be just as deep, but because to get unconventional gas out of shale, Economically, one has to have long laterals. The laterals can be, in fact, longer than the depth of the well. Uh, you have more and heavier drilling equipment. There's a longer drilling time, there's a higher probability of drilling problems, and there's more venting during drilling. That is, you're making gas during the drilling process. As you'll probably gather as I proceed here, there are a lot of technical details involved in developing any gas well that the public doesn't know about. You're going to learn about a couple of them today. Bigger also means that the frack design and a number of stages is bigger. There are more and heavier fracking equipment required, there are more stages and total volume per stage, and there are more plugs and longer drill out period. And I recognize I'm already using jargon that some of you aren't familiar with, so it'll become clear in a minute. And finally, because these wells are bigger, there's more flowback waste, more produced water. That's a different issue for a different time, but coming back with the flowback and coming back with the produced water is methane. And so there's a higher volume of methane over a longer period of time coming back during the time when the well is not yet producing gas. It's still, still producing waste. And finally, during that period of time, there's more venting and or flaring of the gas, which is waste of gas. So typical conventional well, you've all seen this diagram many, many times, goes straight down into a, a gas deposit, a gas resource. Uh, that's a lot different than an unconventional well where you might go down the same or shower depth, but you're going out, typically nowadays on the order of a mile in Pennsylvania and other shale fields around the country and around the world, up to two miles. And so this is a bigger enterprise than a conventional well. What do I mean by bigger enterprise? We have to decide, we have to decide in, in conducting our study, what was going to be a representative unconventional well. We wanted to make sure that that well was not an extreme case, too small, biggest ever. We wanted to make sure it was representative of Marcellus Shale. And so I wanted to point out what things are happening around the world, which we think ultimately will be coming to Marcellus, but are not yet here. And we did not use a well pad of this design in our study. This is the second, large, second largest frack job ever done in the world. As you can see, it's, it's not your grandmother's conventional well in upstate New York. Uh, this is currently the largest frack job ever done. There are 16 wells from this one pad, 417 million gallons of water, you can read it all, but the point here is that these things require more CO2. They produce more CO2 because of what we call indirect emissions from all the equipment that has to be run to develop the well, and they produce more fugitive methane. Uh, 500 frack stages, that's 500 plugs that have to be drilled out or removed. Uh, 10,000 foot laterals means that there's a heck of a lot of more flow back coming from this and from a conventional well. Uh, 40,000 horsepower pumps running in this case for over a year continuously uh, consumes uh, a lot of fuel and produces a lot of CO2. So, but these are not the wells. 
that we focused on. We decided to be conservative. And as you'll sense from everything we talked about, we've tried to be conservative all along. We're not trying to be hyperbolic in our statements. So this is the typical well, the, the generic well on which we based our numbers. Um, it's typical of what Chesapeake has done. In fact, it's the average Chesapeake well in Pennsylvania. And I don't expect you to be able to read all the numbers I'm going to show you in the uh, spreadsheets you're going to say, you're going to see in the next few slides. They're here to show you that we've done due diligence. <coughs> and it took a lot of work on Renee's part and my part to dig up these numbers, and they're all industry numbers. They're not academic high in the sky. Uh, for example, if we know a typical well in Pennsylvania, we can back figure things like how much equipment does it take to drill that well and to produce from it. Uh, another spreadsheet that you'll see in the materials that we'll produce online uh, in the report uh, breaks down all the combustion equipment at the well site. All of this is producing CO2 24-7 for as long as all the wells on that pad uh, are going into uh, development. So again, to emphasize the point that an unconventional well is not a conventional well, just to point out again, it takes 10,000 horsepower, more or less, to do a hydraulic fracturing job on an unconventional well. All right, let me highlight this business of methane, natural gas, that comes out of the well and does not go into the pipeline. There are three sources of that gas during conventional drilling and unconventional drilling, but more so in unconventional drilling for the reasons I just pointed out. During the drilling process, long before any fracking occurs, as you heard from our seminar last week, it is highly likely in the Marcella Shale to encounter shallow gas. While you're drilling through that shallow gas, it doesn't stay down there. It wants to come up the well, and it does, and it's vented. It's not flared. It's vented. It's exhausted to the atmosphere. During flowback, after each stage of fracking, and there are multiple stages of fracking, a production is not yet possible, so the gas that comes up during flowback is either vented or flared. And I should point out that there are many countries around the world where flaring is illegal. It is legal in New York State and Pennsylvania. During plug drill out, again, we, the well cannot yet go into production. They have to remove the plugs between each stage. During that time, there's gas flowing up the well. That gas is either vented or flared. Uh, we conservatively assume in our numbers 50% of the gas that comes up during these periods is vented and 50% is flared. During drilling, as I pointed out, whether it's a conventional well or, or a non-conventional well, there is typically encountered in these regions shallow gas. That shallow gas goes up the casing and it's vented to the atmosphere. We do not include those sources in our numbers. Again, we're trying to be conservative. We do not include any accidents, any incidents, uh, any mi methane migration from around the well or any methane migration up the well during production, during drilling or during hydraulic fracture. So again, we're trying to be conservative. Those are all sources of additional methane. We're ignoring them. Okay, uh, flowback gas. Uh, it takes somewhere around two weeks to go from, we just finished the hydraulic fracturing to connect it to the gathering line, to connect it to the transmission line, to connect it to the distribution line that goes into your gas stove. During that two weeks of flowback, the gas that's coming back with the flowback can be a very high volume. It's typically the same volume that you would get on the first day of production, except that it's mixed with a liquid. That gas is either vented or flared. And as I said, we, could, we take that into account. It's a very large source of gas. Here's another table that you'll see when you read our stuff where we've gone to a bunch of non unconventional sources, uh, gas shells, tight sands, and looks at the amount of uh, flowback gas that's created during the flowback period. As you know, in 